Welcome back to the channel. So uh, today we're actually reviewing uh, Daniel Green's uh, Rebel Screen, which is actually the follow up to Breach of Peace. First of all, two announcements before we get into the review. This is an arc. OK, it was provided to me by Daniel Green two days ago and I read it like. And the next announcement is that I actually just got out of a summer uh, and I finished all my exams. So I'll be back to daily uploads starting from today. So tomorrow you can expect another video the day after that until forever. Let's hope until forever. So you must be wondering, is this book good? Is it bad? Is it worse than Breach of Peace? Is it better than Breach of Peace? Can Daniel Green even write? Can the Goblin Emperor himself? even put together two sentences together and actually write a coherent, competent book. Uh, I am happy to announce, yes, first of all, let's get to the biggest uh, point for Rebel Creed, okay? There is a lot of things that you can say about it. There is a lot of things that it attempts to do. And there is a lot of things that I really loved about it. But the one thing that I really loved most about it is how Daniel Green, as a writer, as an author, has actually done uh, something that I really appreciate in a lot of authors. And this is improving in your subsequent works. So you write a book, I read that book, and then let, let's say there's a second book. I hope to God that you improved in the second book because there is nothing I hate more than a good first book and a bad second book. I will take an okay, an average first book, and I will happily devour the entire series if the second book is better. Why? Because it tells me you as the author care about the product enough to rethink your strategies, to take criticism from the first book and improve upon that. I'll give you an example. I really was kind of disappointed by the character work in uh, Eye of the World. I read that back in September, finished it. I uploaded the review, I think, you know, just uh, two weeks ago. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I just finished the second book four days ago. And guess what? It is way better in terms of character work. The second book adds so much to the character of, you know, uh, Randall Thor, spe specifically because of the setup toward the end of this, you know, first book, A Point of No Return for Randall Thor and his character. And so I really loved what was done with him in the second book. And because of that, I will keep reading The Wheel of Time because my disappointment with the first book was completely resolved. Okay, turns out Randall Thor is not just a cheap chosen one protagonist. I am obsessive when it comes to characters. And the biggest improvement for Rebel's Creed is actually how Danielle writes characters. For the first book uh, with Khalid, uh, you know, Danielle essentially wrote her as a, a vessel for the, for the, or the vehicle for the, for the plot to happen, for the mystery to progress, and for her to motivate, uh, or at least, you know, to get, to act, to act as a link between Chapman and the seventh precinct. Well, in this book, Every character that is written here is not a vehicle for the plot to happen. These are people who live in a world and the world is very oppressive and very authoritarian. And they have all been negatively impacted by this world and they're trying to make it better. In the first novella, the character suffered from a problem where nothing about this was personal. A lot of it was just duty, you know, get the job done. I'm an inspector, so I'm going to inspect the heck out of this crime. OK, it was like that. But in this book, it's like mm -hmm, you did this and this to me and I didn't like that. And I'm going to knock the heck out of you. Uh, so it's much better characters. I'll give you an example. Right. Uh, there are there are four layers for characters. OK, uh, the when it comes to writing ability, there is the one in the, which is the worst one, which is the unmotivated characters that have no depth. And that is where most writers start out. And then you have characters that are well motivated and we understand what their motivation for going after this particular or, or participating in this particular plot is. And then there is the third layer of character writing and it is, uh, you know, specifically internal character writing. So there is internal character arc that happens, a positive internal character arc, a negative internal character arc. And then finally, you have uh, an external character development and also multiple layers coming together. So you might have well-motivated character that is having uh, internal change and external change. Randall Thor from The Wheel of Time happens to be a character with too many mechanics interlaced together, but together interwoven is a word. So for example, he's going through an external development because 
you know, the dragon reborn. And then he's having internal dynamics because he desperately wants to go back, but he has crossed a point of no return by the end of the first book. And this is a character that is very complicated to write because he also has a personal motivated. <laughs> he also has a personal motivation. So he is a character with too many layers for someone to really just put together and slap together and put it out there. It takes time and actually thinking to figure him out. And so he's a very well written character. Uh, the Preach of Peace and the characters in that story suffered from a problem where they actually did not have well motivated, like they were sloppy. To, be, to put it simply, in here, the characters are well motivated and the story is a mystery story, okay? And what that means is when you are writing mystery, you want well motivated characters and you want that motivation to be personal. And therefore, the characters in Rebel's Creed are 10 times better for the story and for the requirements of the story because they really are personally motivated. And they are very well drawn portraits of humans who are struggling with an authoritarian regime. And I absolutely love this. This is the best aspect about this story. One example, okay, uh, it's not going to spoil any part of the story. In fact, Daniel himself has confirmed that Chapman will actually have a backstory. His perspective uh, from uh, Breach of Peace what will be shown in Rebel's Creed. Well, you see, in Breach of Peace, it looked like Chapman was just some guy who was throwing witty lines and he wasn't really, like, his motivation wasn't clear, okay? And we didn't have any, at any time or any page count to sort of delve into his character and understand his motivations. Well, I am happy to announce that Ch Chapman's backstory is actually the highlight of this book for me. Number two, the other highlight is actually this new character Holden and how he is far better written than essentially all the other characters. But Chapman's uh, backstory in, 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 in Rebel's Creed shows his motivations and shows things from his perspective. And you get to see how, you know, the empire and them erasing, erasing people's cultures and people's heritage. In fact, him, uh, his own culture has been essentially erased, right? So he, he wittingly will tell you, I'm doing it because I'm bored, but he's not really doing it because he's bored. He's doing it because he's fighting for, you know, essentially he doesn't like what the empire did to his own uh, culture, okay? And the highlight with him and Birka, you know, these two characters together are just very beautiful dynamics to witness. Uh, another example that I can give you is actually Holden. Uh, Holden, who is, uh, you know, the, the uh, essentially the apprentice or officer, an inspector in training, and he was uh, essentially under the helm of Khalid as well as Salma, uh, Samuel, sorry, Samuel or Sam. And he lost those two characters in Breach of Peace. And this, they were family to him. And him losing those characters motivates him to figure out the conspiracy that is happening. And because you see the empire is feeding him lies, but these are inconsistent lies and he figures them out and he notices them. And so he goes on and he tries to investigate further and he's absolutely traumatized throughout the entire story, falling on, you know, uh, is it, well, I don't want to spoil, but essentially his character crumbles because he's dealing with a lot of this stress uh, of having lost his loved ones and his family in Khalid and, and Sam. And so this is a personal motivation against the empire. Okay, it's not I have to inspect this because I'm an inspector. Okay, it is I have to inspect this because these mother efforts literally took my family away from me. <laughs> this is much better writing because it is writing characters that have personal motivation. Uh, there is a personal stake at play. This is far superior to when it's just a job. Okay, the next point of improvement is actually this is no longer a novella. This is very good because all the improvement that comes uh, in, 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 in this story, I think can mostly be traced back to how the story has a much larger window to breathe. And essentially, because it's not a novella, you know, we get to see Chapman. And now, now he's a far superior character. He's way better written. Uh, you know, uh, Holden gets a lot of pages. I'm talking about 
really pages upon pages to shine and for us to see him in despair and you know for us to understand his motivation and his 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 struggles as a character right uh and also there is a lot more world building that is done right and all of this can be traced back to the reality that this is no longer a novella instead it is actually a novel this is a very good smart choice because it fixes a huge problem in, with breach of peace in the sense that breach of peace did not take its time uh, there were too many elements involved there were literally three stories okay the world and its politics with the nobility and the empire and the struggles between those uh Khalid's perspective and the seventh precinct and the rebellion uh you know Ch with chapman and you know all of these are th too ambitious for a novella if you are writing a novella you want it to have like one of those okay you don't want to have three of this because you have to tell all three and so it was a bad move to make breach of peace a novella but it was a superb move to combine the next two novellas and make them into a novel and that is what i call adjusting your strategy for a better return okay based on feedback <laughs> based on feedback and so i really love that uh this is not uh, a, nove a novella it's a, it's a novel right uh, also, another thing that heavily improved in this particular story is the world building. The world building is so much better. I'm not joking. A lot of the criticism that was thrown at Breach of Peace is that, you know, essentially, uh, it felt like, it didn't even feel like a, a world where magic could even exist. Initially, a lot of people even assumed, I read some of the reviews, and some people commented how they assumed this was not fantasy. <laughs> this was just a, a normal story because nothing about it really felt fantasy. Um, it was as minimalist fantasy as you can get. Uh, it, this was one of the actually visions of the story. However, that vision, while not sacrificed, it's actually the story. There's a lot more to this world now. Uh, I'm not joking. Like we we get to see the Grohalin, the magic system uh, that you know Daniel Green explained in one of his videos about the story. Two videos, I believe. I'm not sure. Uh, don't quote me on that. I'm not sure. Uh, as far as it goes, the Grohalin is a very good magic system and is a very toxic, deadly magic system, and it has beautiful nuances. Uh, number and it has deadly effects. I am not joking. This magic system has deadly effects, and it it actually plays a huge, major role in the finale. Another thing is that it's no longer just you know the capital city of the empire. Now there is even a new world. Uh, uh, th there are other kingdoms. There are there is an extensive history that we get to hear about, and uh, throughout you know uh, Chapman's chapters as well as the rest of the story, it is way way more in depth. Like the world poof, explodes into life in this particular novel, and it is far far better job, right? And so a lot of that, a lot of that can be traced back to how. This is no longer a novella, it's actually a novel. Let's talk about another thing that actually improved in this story, the plot, okay? Again, this can be traced back to how this is no longer a novella, uh, but essentially there is far better plotting. And in this story, there is a particular, uh, uh, you know, improvement from Breach of Peace. The story is no longer uh, a single POV. Uh, Preach of Peace was not exactly single BOV, uh, but you might as well treat it that way because all the other BOVs that we got were not important, okay? Uh, they didn't really add to the story too much, in my opinion. But in Rebel's Creed, you cannot experience this story without the you know perspective juggling that happens in the story it adds so much clarity to the plot and it enhances the overall vision uh, and the overall enjoyment and number four the plot in this story is much more grandiose okay the finale is essentially 90 pages of hectic madness uh it's okay 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 70 to 60 pages of hectic madness. I'm not sure, but it is very large. It took me like two hours. Imagine two hours of freaking bloodbath. That's what the finale is. This is a very, very beautiful uh, crescendo as well, because throughout the novel, we see several different characters coming together. Like we see, we start, we see where they start out and they come together in the finale and it's a beautiful, uh, really bay off in my opinion. And so the plot in this story is much more consistent and much more grandiose. Okay. And that 
is the major improvement in Rebels Creed compared to Breach of Peace. If you want to see, you know, your problems addressed and fixed in the subsequent book, you ought, you owe it to yourself to pick this one up. I really absolutely loved it. Let's get to, uh, you know, some of the problems that I, that, that I noticed that were still present and they were present in Breach of Peace. And I hope in the future Daniel can actually pay heavy attention to this. I, he's a huge fan of Robert Jordan. There is something that Robert Jordan does that no other fantasy author, in my opinion, has ever come close uh, to replicating in, in history. Okay, I don't know about the future. Hopefully someone will one day. Uh, but essentially it's his descriptions. Okay, he has beautiful immaculate descriptions and Daniel is a huge fan of his. And so I would suggest that he really improves and works on the prose. In, in, in his coming uh, future works. I'm very excited for where this story goes because if you read the end of, of, of Rebel's Creed, you're going to have a very good understanding of how the world goes from this to this, okay? And it's really going to be epic reading the future subsequent uh, stories, okay? Uh, however, I really, really hope, because you see, I'm not a fan of minimalist bros. Uh, I really love bros for the sake of bros. I love descriptions for the sake of descriptions. I don't, I don't know why. I think it just adds um, a level of enjoyment and it makes the book not feel like a screenplay. Okay, there are good chunks of this uh, Rebel's Creed where the book essentially feels like a screenplay. This is a very common uh, modern trend in modern fantasy where a lot of fantasy books feel and read like screenplays. I am not fond of this. I am really not fond of this. <laughs> I absolutely abhor this. Uh, I don't like it because why would I read your book when I can read a screenplay? Uh, but essentially, essentially, I don't like minimalist prose. I did get over it in, you know, like 50, 60 pages in. I really just stopped focusing on that and I started, you know, reading it for the sake of the characters because suddenly I noticed, wow, okay, the characters are way superior. I need to just pay attention to this. Uh, and I did and I enjoyed it far more. The next problem is actually something that does not bother me. It is dialogue. Okay, the this is a problem in the in Breach of Peace as well as in Rebel's Creed because the dialogue is functional. The characters, a lot of them sound the same. In fact, if you were to just read the dialogue, uh, you would need, you would require the dialogue tags. Okay, you would 100% require the dialogue test because a lot of them just have the same voice. Uh, so the characters, a lot of them don't have unique voice except Chapman. And then there is the basing. Uh, the basing in some places felt too fast and in others it felt a little too slow. Uh, specifically, you know, from uh, 70 pages to like 150 pages, the basing feels slow. Okay, uh, this is a, you know, sort of a, a mild case of uh how do you put it saggy middle syndrome yeah a mild case of saggy middle syndrome it's a mild case because because i have read severe cases where books will have a fat case of a saggy middle syndrome uh like wizard first rule that book has like 300 pages that can easily be cut and it is a lot of stuff that just doesn't add to the story and it's just the characters running from plot point to the next plot point and that was dull to read this was not dull to read. That's what, because you see, it builds the characters. Uh, and therefore, I don't think it's really a huge deal, but at the same time, I can notice the first beginning reads like fire, the finale feels, reads like fire, but the middle reads like cold water, okay? And so it is still punchy, but at the same time, it's not as much fire as the beginning and the end. So the basing is not very consistent. Uh, and also the basing from chapter to chapter is not also consistent, but I don't consider that a problem. The main problem here is the major sections of the story, the beginning, the middle and the finale. The beginning and the uh, finale feel like very fast, but the middle feels a little slow, a little slow. And so those are the three problems that I've really noticed that kind of ached, uh, uh, bothered me as I was reading the story, okay? There is a final uh, thing that I would like to actually note. And here, that thing is how the vision of Daniel stays consistent. This is something that I find very impressive because uh, when writing books, I, I love it if the author has a vision. I want to write a book is not a vision. 
you have to have a vision for the book okay you need to have a theme or this is very beautifully constructed like this world uh, the theme here of authoritarian uh, you know regimes and how they suppress people uh, and essentially the nature of revolution and a lot of the different ways that revolution can be inspired uh, is very well depicted here. So this vision of this heavily authoritarian world, uh, so much so as so much to the extent that, you know, you will see like Ministry of Truth, Ministry of, of Science, you know, uh, it is taken heavily from, you know, 1984. Uh, essentially, this is very beautiful. This is very well constructed. But also another thing that is very well done is how you know there is heavy influence of like horror uh, from Stephen King and then there is a huge uh, you know emphasis on the mystery and 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 you know the characters going to investigate to an extent where essentially all the protagonists like Chapman, Holden, Clid they are or they were inspectors uh, I consider Holden an inspector because you know he's an officer but whatever you get the point so essentially this is very well done. So Daniel's vision stays consistent and he manages to push through and to keep that vision online uh, while also improving it, which is very good. Let me give it a final star rating. So point by point, I'll award different things, uh, different star rating. Uh, so I'll, I'll give it one out of one for the world building. The world building does not just improve, it is a thousand times better compared to Breach of Peace because there is actually a world here. There is actually a world here. This is a very important thing to say because it felt like there was none in the, in the original uh, novella. But in here, there is an active, deliberate effort to get you to be experience what this world is like. And not only do you get to experience it through the characters, but also uh, through stories and conversations that they have. So I'll award another uh, another star for the plot because the plot here is far better, much more consistent, much more focused, much more grandiose. I hope this is kept. Uh, another note, another note. I think Daniel should stick to novels from here onwards. He's very ambitious, and novels, novellas always cripple people that are ambitious, man. You just gotta stick to novels because novels have no limit. You could have 400,000 words and call it a novel. You could have 50,000 words and call it a novel. Uh, essentially, the more ambitious you are, the more it becomes necessary that you stick to novels, okay? And then there is going to be one star for, you know, sort of the, the, the thing that I've established in the beginning, which is improving upon the first work. Uh, as far as it goes, you know, he adjusted his strategy. This is not a novel. He, uh, you know, added the magic system, expanded the world, improved the plot, improved heavily on the characters. And so all of those things come together. That is one stop. Not only that, but also he maintains his vision. And all of those things, those are small things that are righted as well, which come together, not often acknowledged, but because I'm a writer, I'm aware of these things and I can acknowledge them, okay? And then there is a final thing, which is my favorite jam, okay? And it is the characters. It was coming one and a half stars out of two stars, okay, uh, for the characters. I love characters, man. Better written characters, well-motivated, well-established, clear, concise characters. Uh, I love it also when they have internal dynamics. And I love it when those internal dynamics are combined with external development. And, you know, those internal dynamics also might or might not result in character arcs that are oftentimes either positive character arcs or negative character arcs. I can give you an example for, uh, like, Boromir from um, uh, Fellowship of the Rings. You have him, he has a negative character arc, right? Uh, like, Tyrion Lannister, he has a negative character arc. Uh, Jamie Lannister, positive character arc. Those are characters with internal dynamics. I just love that kind of stuff. Uh, so there you go. And I also love external development, like Kavoth. He has a, a negative external development, okay? Also a negative character arc because he suffers from apathy. Uh, it all adds up to four and a half stars. I absolutely loved this novella. I absolutely loved how uh, Daniel Green improved on everything, uh, except you know some problems are still there: dialogue, bros, uh, the basing, uh, and so on and so forth, right? But uh, as far as things go and as far as things count, this is 
five times, at least five times better than Bridge of Peace. I might be biased because of the character work, because that improves a lot, but screw it. This is five times better. It's fact. I'm putting it on stone. It's five times better. So four and a half out of five stars for this uh, uh, novel. Uh, Rebels Creed is a jam. You should 100% pick it up. It's you should you don't want to miss this if you read Breach of Peace. Uh, so remember, I'll be starting day. I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to daily uploads. Uh, so you know, stick along. Also, I'll be making a review for my reading journey of the Wheel of Time book two. Uh, it's coming in the in the next week. It will be a far more positive review, okay? Because again. The characters are way better uh, so there you go i hope you enjoyed this video have a nice day bye please please consider subscribing have a nice day bye